tonight. US on the edge. Trump and Harris make last-minute appeals to voters ahead of election day as voters are overwhelmed. Volcanic eruption. Indonesia's Mount Levatobi erupts, killing at least 10 and destroying homes. Facing off. Ukrainian and North Korean troops clash for the first time in Russia's Kursk region. And thrilling discovery. Here Chopin vaults unearthed in New York Museum after nearly 200 years. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other Than a World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We are here to bring you key stories across the globe for this Tuesday and we begin today on the road to the White House. The finish line is in sight in one of the closest United States presidential elections in modern history. With voting already begun and polls pointing to an extremely tight contest between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, people across the US expressed excitement, hope and also fatigue in the final hours of the US election. Worry and anticipation is gripping the United States as Americans gear up for Election Day in a contest both candidates have portrayed as an existential moment in the nation's history. After a heated battle between the two parties and an astonishing series of events over the last few months, including Democrat Kamala Harris replacing Joe Biden's spot in the presidential race and two attempts on Republican Donald Trump's life, polls point to an electorate divided down the middle. More than 78 million voters have already cast their ballots, and there's millions more to come. After Trump began the day in North Carolina, his supporters gathered for an election eve rally in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The state offers the biggest electoral college payout of the seven battleground states expected to determine the outcome of the election. Let's get this done. Thank you all. Harris spent the entire day in Pennsylvania and chose Pittsburgh to hold a dueling event. Many voters told Reuters campaign ads are driving up their stress levels. This voter in West Ellis, Wisconsin, says he's over it. Nonpartisan U.S. election analysts calculate Harris needs to win about 45 electoral votes on top of the states she is expected to win easily to capture the White House, while Trump would need about 51. Over in Indonesia, at least 10 people have died and homes have been destroyed after Indonesia's powerful volcano Mount Levatobi Laki Laki erupted. Volcanic materials were flung up to six kilometers from the crater, blanketing nearby towns with ash and prompting residents to flee. According to the Indonesian Center for Volcanology and Geological Disaster Mitigation, Mount Leotobi Mlakilaki, located on Flores Island in the east of the country, erupted at 11.57 on Sunday night, explosively spearing columns of scorching lava and volcanic ash, which hit villages some four kilometers away, burning houses and damaging infrastructure. Now, local authorities said that the volcano has been raised to the highest alert level, with residents in a seven-kilometer radius from the volcano's crater urgently evacuated, while villages within 20 kilometers of the crater have also begun evacuating. Indonesia's volcano agency also warned of potential flash floods and cold lava flows in the coming days. Unprecedented air pollution in the Pakistani city of Lahore has forced authorities to close all primary schools for a week. 50% of office workers will also work from home as part of a green lockdown plan. Now, to get latest updates on the situation in Lahore, we have Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Amar Gauss joining from Karachi. Amar, could you explain to us the concerns regarding these high toxicity levels in the air and has it impacted the citizens already? Thank you, Mekla. Lahore, which is Pakistan's second largest city with over 14 million residents, faces record high levels of air pollution as a smog blankets the city. 
dangerous air level qualities which has been caused by vehicle emissions, crop burning and winter air patterns has led the government to close primary schools and restrict polluting vehicles, barbecue setups and construction activities in the city. Officials in Punjab which has uh, have uh, recently issued a rare appeal for cross uh, for climate diplomacy with India seeking cross border cooperation to tackle the shared air pollution crisis the chief minister of punjab emphasizes that this air pollution impacts both nations uh, across border as the winds carry pollutants from india to lahore and other cities in pakistan this they emphasize is a humanitarian issue and not a political one affecting millions across both pakistan and india Lahore and New Delhi, which are often regarded as two of the most polluted cities in the world, have all, uh, on a yearly basis, experienced severe smog when it comes to winter. New Delhi, which recently revealed its air quality index to be in the hazardous levels of above 500, had its air quality worsened by Diwali celebration, as well as ongoing stubble burning despite local bans. According to the World Health Organization, prolonged exposure to smog significantly raises the risks of lung cancer, stroke and heart disease. In response to the air pollution levels, the Punjab government has begun providing subsidized, uh, subsidized super seeds to farmers as an alternative to burning crop residue, while continuing to seek for regional cooperation on solutions for cleaner air. Thank you. That was other there in a world news special correspondent Amar Gauss from Karachi, Pakistan. Ukrainian soldiers engaged North Korean troops deployed to fight alongside the Russian military in Russia's southwestern Kursk region for the first time. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said that the troops were met in the region where the Russian military is currently attempting to drive out the armed forces of Ukraine. Ukraine has confirmed for the first time a military encounter with North Korean soldiers in the Kursk region of Russia. The head of the Center for Countering Disinformation under Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, Andriy Kovalenko, said Monday that the first North Korean troops had already come under fire in Kursk. Though no additional information was given, this marks Kyiv's first direct engagement with North Korean soldiers supporting Moscow. According to Kyiv's Defense Intelligence Agency, over 7,000 North Korean soldiers had been dispatched to areas near the border with Ukraine. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres expressed grave concerns about reports of the dispatch. In a statement on Sunday, Guterres said the North Korean troops' possible deployment to the conflict zone would represent a very dangerous escalation of the war in Ukraine. He added that everything must be done to avoid any internationalization of the conflict. The South Korean government delegation returned home on Monday after discussing cooperation measures with Ukraine regarding the North's troop deployment to Russia. Last week, Defense Minister Kim Yong-hyun had said that the delegation would return to South Korea around November the 4th. After a debriefing, the government plans to discuss measures for cooperation with Ukraine and the international community. The measures will likely involve dispatching a team to Ukraine to monitor the North's military movements. While in Ukraine, the delegation exchanged battlefield information and explored cooperation measures. According to Western spy agencies, Russia's scheme to send incendiary devices shipped through a commercial carrier on planes that would potentially end up in the United States. Intelligence agencies across Europe have warned that Russia is plotting violent acts of sabotage across the continent in a response to countries' support for Ukraine. According to the Wall Street Journal, two incendiary devices were shipped using the German logistics company DHL and ignited at DHL Logistics Hub in Leipzig, Germany, and in Birmingham, England in July, sparking a multinational investigation. Security officials and sources familiar with the investigation told the journal that intelligence agencies in Europe determined the explosions were caused by electric massages implanted with a magnesium-based flammable substance. Those officials say the election. Well, let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side.
Welcome back. In the escalating conflict between Iran and Israel, reports indicate that Iran is preparing to deploy advanced warheads that have not been previously utilized in their military operations. It comes as a retaliatory attack against Israel after the U.S. election, aiming to avoid influencing it. Despite U.S. warnings, Iran is signaling a strong and complex response that will take place after the election, but before the new president is inaugurated in January. The Wall Street Journal reported on Sunday that Iran's response will involve more than just missiles and drones involving more powerful warheads. This follows Israel's airstrikes on October 26, which severely damaged Iran's air defenses and led to military and civilian casualties. Disturbing videos captured at a college football game show Florida deputies repeatedly punching fans in the stands. The violent incident took place at Everbank Stadium in Jacksonville during a game between the University of Florida and the University of Georgia. The Jacksonville, Florida Sheriff's Office says it's reviewing multiple violent altercations between police and fans at the Georgia-Florida football game on Saturday. That's assault. Jeremy Williamson says he recorded this video in the second quarter after an argument over verifying the fans' digital ticket. They made contact with this man, and when he said, he said, I'm not leaving my seats, I paid for him, and they immediately pulled a taser on him. And that wasn't the only altercation at the stadium. Multiple videos show a struggle in the fourth quarter between three officers and at least two fans. Then two officers appear to start punching the fans. Jacksonville's mayor saying, I'm aware of several disturbing videos circulating. The incidents are under investigation. One safety analyst says it appears the officers were following their training because one fan could be seen with his hand around an officer's waist near the officer's firearm. A Peruvian soccer player was killed when he was struck by lightning that had just caused a delay in his team's match. A football player has been killed in Peru after being struck by lightning. Footage shows some nine players immediately fall to the ground following a lightning strike on the football pitch in Huancayo, central Peru on Sunday. A thunderstorm suspended the game earlier, but as players were exiting the pitch, Lightning directly struck a 39-year-old footballer from Familia Choca team who died. Now four others were also injured, with one in critical condition due to high degree of burns. The United Nations says some 135,000 people have been displaced from Sudan's Al Jazeera in a series of revenge attacks by the paramilitary rapid support forces following the defection of its chief in the state. Salwa Abdallah was recuperating from a caesarean section when soldiers burst into her home. They were from the Rapid Support Forces, one side in Sudan's 19-month-old war. They accused her of supporting their rivals, the Sudanese army and its allies, and threatened to kill her, her child and her mother, and rape her daughters. The incident took place in Sudan's El Gazira last month. The eastern state has suffered a series of intense violent raids over the past two weeks, affecting, according to activists, at least 65 villages and towns. Having walked for days, Abdallah and her family are now at a camp in neighbouring Kasala state. They are among the 135,000 people the United Nations says have been displaced by this latest burst of violence. Al Ghazira had already been subject to a violent looting campaign by the RSF since it took control last December. But the defection last month of its chief in the state unleashed a series of revenge attacks. <laughs> the Wad Medani Resistance Committee, a pro-democracy group, named 169 people killed since the violence began on October 20, though in a statement it said there were hundreds more. <laughs> The worst incident was in Al Sareha, where the committee said 124 people were killed on October 25. Uh, Showed dozens of bodies wrapped up in sheets for burial. The RSF has denied ordering the attacks and said they were the result of the army arming local communities. The war has unleashed a hunger crisis across Sudan, with both sides accused of hindering international aid. <laughs> 
Backing Kassal Estate, Hashim Bashir, sits in the bus that brought him here from his home in El Gazira. His leg was amputated before the war began, but his disability didn't stop soldiers from throwing him out of his home. His niece, Fayeja Muhammad, says soldiers beat her uncle and threw his wheelchair on top of him. She was also beaten, she says, including her earring being ripped from her ear. They displaced us, burned down our homes and starved us, she says. May God inflict harm on them. All right, let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. And finally tonight, a fascinating story about a new musical piece believed to be by the Polish composer Frédéric Chopin has been discovered nearly 200 years after it was written. It's the song exciting classical music lovers across the world. A waltz composed by Frédéric Chopin, the iconic 19th century classical composer, written nearly 200 years ago and its existence unknown until now. The piece of music was discovered this spring in the collections of the Morgan Library and Museum in New York City. This unnamed waltz, the first new piece of music by Chopin found since the 1930s, and this week experts verified its authenticity. The museum's curator, Robinson McClellan, is the one who first came across the waltz. Concert pianist and Columbia professor Magdalena Sturmbachewska played the piece for us and said she spent hours with her students trying to decode this new piece of music. It's believed Chopin may have written close to 30 waltzes, but only 17 of them have been published. The others lost to history. The rarity of discoveries like this creating a reaction that even McClellan didn't expect, proving one of the greatest prodigies from the past can still surprise us. And with that, we wrap up today's bulletin. Join us again tomorrow for the latest updates from around the world. Until then, thank you for watching and have a good night.